Coming up next, a very special interview that I was over the moon to get. This rock icon released his debut album in the early 80s. It was self-funded, but then his career would take a long five-year hiatus. He became homeless, sleeping on friends' couches while struggling with addiction. He was even in and out of jail. He took these real-life born-to-lose experiences, though, and he released a classic album with the three big singles that took him from homeless to hit status with two straight gold records. Also, he's the heir to Johnny Cash. I'll explain why up next. This icon tells a story. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you want the straight stories behind rock's legendary hits straight from the artist, make sure that you subscribe below right now and click the bell so you always know when our new interviews are dropping. Also, check out our exclusive content on Patreon and also our latest merch below that helps us keep it a daily channel. So I've always wanted to interview today's artist. I discovered him through Columbia House, you know, their 12 albums for a penny deal. I actually signed up back in the day under like 10 different aliases. You know, in order to build my music collection, uh, that's the way we did it before Spotify, right? All the music you love, the Columbia Record and Tape Club. But you know, this band, this front man, the music that he created, it just spoke to me, you know, with his rockabilly meets punk attitude and his Johnny Cash by the way of Rolling Stones style. They really shook up mainstream radio as the 80s were turning into the 90s. I'm, of course, talking about Mike Ness of Social D, Social Distortion. And, uh, you know, his third self-titled album with the amazing song, Story of My Life. Story of my life. Ball and Chain. Take away this ball and chain. And his Johnny Cash cover, Ring of Fire. This album was a true revelation for me at that moment. It actually fits our show revelations very well. You know, of course, artists go deep on their great songs and albums. So I was able to sit down with the man himself, Mike Ness, and he told me the story of this great record and the songs that made it one of the best albums of its time, one of the best ever. So Mike Ness started Social D after being blown away by punk rock. And uh, his first album which was self-funded, it came out in 1983. Uh, it was called Mommy's Little Monster, and it had bite, man. But Mike Ness, he would encounter some really rough times. He found himself homeless. He was sleeping on friends' couches. He would spiral into addiction. He'd even have his troubles with the law, in and out of jail. But he was able to kick his habit. And a full five years later, he put out his second record. That's a long time between records and your first start now. This album was called Prison Bound. And uh, then he got his first real record deal and he released his first album that he didn't have to fund himself. Talking about the one I just talked about, the self-titled Social Distortion record that took him to the masses on the strength of Story of My Life and Ball and Chain. And it gave him a gold record. His next album, Somewhere Between Heaven and Hell, was his second straight gold album. It included the classic song, Bad Luck, another great record. Bad, bad luck, bad. So coming up next, Mike Ness, the prophet of rockabilly punk, and really, in my opinion, the heir to Johnny Cash's Born to Lose Crown. He tells us this story, the story of the experiences that he went through. He's the real deal, man. Like I said, the heir to Johnny Cash's throne because just like Johnny Cash, he's taken his real life experience and turned it into music that means something to all of us. I love this interview. You're not going to want to miss it. Here it is. Well, Ball and Chain, let me ask you about that because yes. uh, that, I always heard you say that that's kind of a hard luck story. A uh, forceful cry, a lament, a plea, a folk prayer. I love that imagery because I read that in an interview one time where you said that. Tell me about that and how it came about. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's all of those things that you said. <laughs> um, but it's funny. It was, it was very retrospective. Of, you know, and I'm clean a few years, and uh, 
you know, it was. It was like the ball and chain was my my addiction and, yeah. and stopping me from doing the things in life that I wanted to do. And when you think about it, I mean, the song kind of is really like a prayer. Well, I sit and I pray in my broken it's about someone who just, you know, still trying to kind of find themselves. Did the the verses come first or the chorus? Like, take me through a little bit of that song, if you don't mind. Well, I mean, most of the time I write the music first. There is the, I call it a gift when, and it's only like one out of, maybe it's two out of 10, but <laughs> usually one out of 10 times where you're coming up with something and the hook line comes right with it. And then you've, then you've pretty much got the whole song yeah. because you can play off that. But that doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. So I have a lot of songs yet that I'm like, they're done, you know, but what is this song about? Yeah. I, I don't know yet. I always loved the honky tonk version that you did. You know, I like it and, okay. Yeah, it yeah. was, it's just, it's just interesting to hear as the song changes some years it's, later. It's and, really fun to take a song and, and go at it with a different approach. You know, sometimes I don't pick up a guitar for three months, you know, but I'm busy with life and doing life. And when I do pick up the guitar, it's, uh, it's time for, for it to pour out. Well, I loved that you say that about the guitar putting it down because I always remember reading uh, a like spirit, Bruce Springsteen, what Bruce said about there were two important days in my life. The first day was when I learned to pick up the guitar. The second day was the day I learned how to put it down, mm -hmm. to live life and enjoy it. Yeah, I like, I like yeah, to hear that yeah. because it's true. You know, you have your passion, but you have to be able to. Yeah, and you have to be living life. I mean, I had a family to raise. I had a... Uh, a wife and kids and, you know, uh, who deserved my attention too. La, 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 la. Like all great songs, it's only three chords. Yeah. Well, I remember when I heard this record and I heard Story of My Life, and I know so many people feel this way, they literally felt like you wrote the song for them. Like that was the story of their life as well. And and that's what it felt like. It felt like a, a real tell of youth, of what you had gone through. Like, take me through kind of the verses and the chorus and just what you were thinking about that and, and just... Well, I don't know. You yeah. know, that's the thing. Was it like stream of conscience type of thing or was it something... The song that, has something in it that if I could figure it out, I'd bottle it You'd up do and it every sell time. it. You know, I'd be, <laughs> yeah. I'd be peddling it right yeah. now, you know. I don't know, you know. I do go back to it often to find out, to try and uh, absorb what it is. It's just kind of a universal thing. You're right though, it's about youth. It's about the frustration of being young and trying to figure things out. Rock and roll weekend, as you say. Yeah, and <laughs> going for a job it. interview and then looking and like, God, I look like Holes a slob. Like, it's like, yeah, they're not gonna hire me. Went downtown to look for a job. I guess I'm talking about being a misfit in, in, in school, you know? So you got your, your alienation, you know, the old neighborhoods changed. Yeah. And yeah, just It's almost like a you can't go home again type thing. Yeah. So this is when we were, um, you know, obviously going from independent punk band, we get signed to a major label. Yeah. Great. You know, it's every band's dream. I get to quit f***ing painting houses, <laughs> which there was not much applause in. I got to buy a house. I got to go on tour full time. You know, you're on a major label. Now there's people involved and they're people with money because they're funding it all. You know, so we got an art meeting to discuss the art for the fucking record. <laughs> it was like some fucking middle-aged woman, the <laughs> guy with a fucking, I used to call him weird beard, and some other guy. <laughs> and it's like, first of all, I mean, do you even know who Social Distortion is yeah. and what we're about? It was such a disconnect. 
well, you know, we we want to try and get this. I don't know what, what was. Maybe it was like Kmart or at the time. <laughs> right, right. We like to get this in Kmart. I had photographs yeah. of all of this. I think it was. It came down to licensing of the photos or something because the pictures I had found it were probably out of a book, tabletop book or something or a movie. Yeah. So, but I felt honestly that the illustrations still um, captured the emotion. My kids found it through Guitar Hero. And I love that, how you hear these songs as a kid and you love them and then your kids, you don't even have to force it on them, they actually find it themselves. Well, that's awesome. And there's <laughs> something about our music that is timeless and you know, we're just lucky that way. I mean, sometimes the bus has to park, you know, alongside the venue and, you know, there's a line of people standing in line. And I, my, one of my favorite things to do is to just look at the, like, difference from each person as you go down the line. Sometimes parents are bringing their kids, you know. I like to see it when there's kids bringing their parents. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Yeah. You know, let's see, uh, and I love to bring kids up on the stage, you know, and just get their get in their mind. But I love seeing like older people, like I mean, I see yeah. some like cotton tops at our shows sometimes. Yeah. You know, it's like, whoa, you're into social D, like yeah. You know, like yeah, man. You know, you opened up for Neil Young. We loved you. Yeah, and I was like, wow. And our but our crowd always was diverse. We had college kids. We had older guys it's it has it's it's um generational and it's timeless and you know we're just very lucky i mean I, I never set out to do that for us it's the live performance i mean we make great records but our we take our pride in our live performances right oh, because yeah. people are there they've paid money it's saturday night they've been working hard all week they want a freaking show and you got to yep. deliver. And, you know, that's just something, that's something from the punk scene that I held on to. I held yeah. on to the rebelliousness. I held on to the angst. I held the on hunger. to the anger, the hunger, the yeah. honesty. And I just blended it in with yeah. some other shit. But, yeah. you know, the most important thing about this record, this was about taking a risk. When you're creating something that you haven't heard it before yourself, there's a chance it could fucking dive bomb, you know? Oh, yeah. I had no idea if people were going to like Story of My Life, Sick Boys, Ball and Chain. I had no idea. I, in my mind, I was doing something new, and I was just being true to myself. And I was creating something. You know, I just had to believe in myself. I wrote a record that I liked and hope, hoped that other people would like it. And I kind of still do that. Your approach to Ring of Fire, too. Let's talk about that, because I always oh, yeah, loved... that wasn't very punk either to do at the time. <laughs> I loved it. And they're like, you're going to do a Johnny Cash song? I'm because like, I... Yeah, Johnny Cash is yeah. fucking cool, you fucking numbskull. <laughs> I know. Ten years later, everybody got that after, yeah. right? Yeah. It took him until after the American recordings. I was fortunate, because my mother had rock and roll records. My father had country yeah. records around the house. And uh, that I was fortunate enough to hear that as a kid, and as well as like acts like the Carter family oh, yeah. or Buck Owens, that just uh, something about them just stayed with me. When I was 17, I couldn't listen to a five minute long blues song anymore for a while. It was just like, put on some Sham 69, let's get drunk and let's go 
fucking bite somebody, you know. <laughs> but, but it eventually came back and went full circle. I remember hearing it as a kid, two, three years old, because mm -hmm. my grandpa listened to all the old country records. Mm -hmm. When I bought this and saw it, I thought, that's got to be a cover, mm -hmm. a ring of fire. When I listened to it, mm -hmm. I was like, man, I was in heaven. Johnny Cash, you know, as well as most all of my influences, number one are, uh, he's a great storyteller. And storytelling is what has just always captivated me. And uh, he also has a very haunting voice and yeah. very lonesome, much like Hank Williams did the same thing for me. It was like, oh my God, this guy just sounds like he's gonna die any minute, you know, he's like, He's suffering. He's, you know, yeah. he's really in pain. Or, or you listen to like Lead Belly and those Mississippi uh, John Hurt or something. You know, yeah. it's just like or Mississippi Fred McDowell. It's just like, man, this just sounds desperate. When I heard the Carter family, it was, they, it was music of the depression. They sounded hungry. <laughs> I mean, they, they sounded hungry. They probably were. You know. And I just, I related. Looking back on your career to this point, um, if you were to give the world a 45 record, a double A side, remember how the Beatles had like yes. double A, you know, one song on each side that is, this is who Mike Ness is, this is who Social Distortion is, of the songs you've written, what would those two songs be? Songs and then I'll mine? ask you the second part. Yeah, songs of yours. Like that, what would be your, like your legacy, like uh, to, up like to this to put point. It in a time capsule. Yeah, and, up to this point. And then the year. Say, this is who I am. 3,000, they, yeah. they pull it out and go, there wow, you go. this is some crazy ass shit. <laughs> exactly. You know, uh, the song Sweet and Low Down on the last record for me was one of my favorite songs. I had to challenge myself with the writing on that because I didn't, you know, it's like, oh, I'm getting autobiographical again. It could be too, maybe people might get tired of hearing about Mike Ness's hard time. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? You, yeah. you can't help but take that stuff into consideration. So I, I went into character writing where I just removed myself and just started writing about the same. St and the song is, it's still about me, but it's, it was so liberating. To, and it was another lesson. It was like, ooh, that's cool. Like, uh, that's one of my favorite songs. Yeah. It's uh, one of my favorite songs to perform live. It's kind of a tongue in cheek, you know, attitude about writing about just things going on. The other one, damn. <laughs> it's a tough question, I know. Yeah. I'm in so many songs. Hmm. I would have to say Ring of Fire. It's so funny when you do someone else's song, mm -hmm. but it becomes just, it becomes you. you part of you, yeah. You know? Because music shapes you. Music and art are, are so uh, influential. Like I said, you know, the 75-year-old cotton top <laughs> and the, and the five-year-old and everything in between. I'm grateful for that, uh, that span and that variety. Like I said, standing, looking out of the bus and seeing the different uh, types of people who are coming to see social stores. It's not all just one, you know. It's not all the punk rockers. It's not all the punk rockers it's... and it's not all the greasers and it's not all the hardcore kids. It's, 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 it's everything because I do feel that music is universal. It's something that reaches deeper than uh, you know our outer shell of what we're 
wearing or what we're presenting ourselves as or what we do for a living, those, those don't define us. You know, what define us is what shaped us as kids and, and the adults that we became. Story of my life. Man, I was fanboying on that one. I love Mike Ness. Uh, leave us a comment about Mike Ness and social distortion. What are your memories and your thoughts on this icon of rockabilly punk? Let's talk about his music in the comments. Uh, if you dig our content, make sure to subscribe below, be a part of our content. You just never know who we're gonna interview. One day, it could be Rob Halford from Judas Priest. The next day, it could be Barry Manilow. I mean, we cover the, the gala here, we really do. Till next time, three chords, and yeah, the truth, my friends. <laughs>